gets right to it. So we've decided to call this one the Zen Koans of Tantra because we're going to talk a little bit about the Shaktopaya today, the way of Shakti, practice as conceived of by Shakti. So as we were discussing last night in Tantra, there are generally speaking three types of practices, three categories or three flavors of practices. So if you're doing a practice, chances are it fits into one or more of these three categories. So briefly, briefly then, what are the categories? The first one, we'll just kind of do it from the grossest to the subtlest. The first one is anavopaya. Anava means atom. Literally, anu means atom. So when we say anavopaya, what we're saying is the way of the individual. Atom here means atomized individual, the way of the person. So of this trinity, Shiva, Shakti, and me, I'm like the meekest, smallest, littlest one of all three, right? I am the ultimate contraction, where Shiva represents the ultimate expansion. I am the most contracted of all of that. You know, so the, 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 the cosmology of Tantra is this vibratory spectrum of various degrees of frequency with Shiva being the highest, most expanded frequency. And with me, the individual being the most contracted, densest frequency. So my journey in spiritual life is from a low density frequency to like high vibrational frequency. And, and in many new age circles today have used that kind of language, right? You know, raise your vibes or raise your frequency, something like that. But that language appears actually in 10th century and, and 11th century Tantra. So now as the individual, my practices, the anava upaya, upaya, as we said last night, means technique or practice. As an individual, I have a whole plethora of techniques that I can use to, quote unquote, raise my vibration. So many things I can use to purify, first and foremost, my body. Deha shuddhi. Shuddhi in Sanskrit means to purify. So I have so many techniques and an unending series of techniques that I can employ right away to increase the overall purity of the body. Deha shuddhi. Now there's also uh, even more techniques that I can use for chitta shuddhi, the purification of the mind. So what are these techniques? Well, to name a few, hatha yoga. I have all these postures I can do. Oh, that's such a nice armband, Madeline. I love it so much. So nice. Wow, handmade from the desert. From um, the Amazon. Wow, so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you look like Wonder Woman or like a superhero. You know, you've got to. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> yes. Nice to talk about the way of Shakti today. You know what I'm saying? So. Say, yeah, like Kali wears, or even you see the the the, the female deities with those cuffs, even. Yeah, Kali the wears. cuffs. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, like armor, right? You use it to protect yourself from Mahishasura sword like cling then you <laughs> warrior of love mode yeah <laughs> yes truly warrior of love oh goddess Kali such is your mercy that even as you send those uh, even as you slay those frenzied hostile throngs you still lead them to heaven by from death in battle with you right in the Chandi it says that <laughs> anyway okay so um <laughs> Uh, okay, so Anavopaya, I can do Hatha Yoga. I can do these postures and these postures will press into my lymphatic nodes and release lymphatic fluid that purify me on a physical level, increase my immunity, um, help my blood circulate around the body, Im improve the flow of nervous electricity up and down the spine throughout the nervous system, etc. So the Hatha Yoga poses, they purify the body. Then Pranayama, I can do a bunch of breathing techniques. And pranayama is about a much more than the breath. You know, breath is like the flywheel that operates a very vast and intricate system of pranas. In tantra, there are typically five main channels of prana. Not channels, but movements, really. You know, there are three main channels of prana, ida, pingala, and shushumna. You know, the three, oh, we don't need to get into it today. But there are five pranas. Apana vayu, prana vayu, um, udana vayu, samana vayu, vya, uh, vyapana vayu all these different different pranas so anyway five pranas and so when i do pranayama i can purify on the level of the subtle body so i have practices for my physical body i have practices for my subtle body then i have practices for my mind my mental body namely bhavana visualizations or creative meditations i can visualize as i inhale a sun turning into a moon and I can visualize the moon coming down through the crown of my head, going into my heart. And as I inhale, I take an apana vayu, that downward moving energy, that clean, clear, refreshing lunar ray 
this is the Shiva current, right? Ah, It's feminine, it's yin, and I'm taking it down. Hmm? Feminine in the yin yang sense, but in a tantric sense, it's masculine. It's a passive principle. So I'm taking it down. Then I can visualize here in my heart the sunrise. As I exhale, I can see the sun rising from my heart, going up through the crown of my head and coming out here in the Dwadash Anta. So I'm visualizing moon coming down on the inhale, exhale, sun coming out. And then sun turns into the moon, inhale, moon comes on, moon turns into sun like that. So I'm playing with this white and red light, this kind of visualization. That is Chitta Shuddhi. I'm purifying the mind through a creative visualization in a meditation context. These are all, all of these come under the category of Anavopaya. I have to stress this because when I say the way of Shakti, typically what people will think is, oh, embodied practice right? No, actually all practice that you can do with the body, breath, and mind, everything that you can do as an individual um, is under the category Anavaupaya as expounded by Abhinava Gupta. So why is it Anavaupaya? We can say anything that can be seen is Anavaupaya, meaning if you're doing these practices, other people know you're doing them. They're like obvious, you know, even if you're sitting and meditating, even though it's like this internal experience, it's still um, visible to others because you have to be sit seated in a certain posture. You know, you're seated with the head, neck, and spine all in alignment. Your eyes are closed. And it's obvious to others that you're meditating. Mm -hmm. What more uh, when you're doing hatha yoga or you're doing this, you're sitting on the banks of the Ganga going, everybody knows you're practicing. These, these are very obvious forms of practice. So a general rule is this. If it looks like I'm practicing, it's an anavopaya. You know? And of course, this is not just Hatha Yoga, Pranayama. Um, it's not just uh, meditations or visualizations. It's also puja, ritual worship, going to the temple, praying to deities, having pictures in your home of deities. This is all under the category of Anavapaya. So you can then say from this, you can conclude that the broad base of this tantric tradition consists of Anavapayas. So many methods. And it's, it's like literally endless. And the beautiful thing about Tantra is that you can come up with your own methods. You can find new ones and you can develop new modalities. There's so many infinite ways to work with the body, breath, and mind to attain liberation, to awaken to your true essence nature as all bodies, all minds, as this whole matrix of sound. Okay, now let's go to Shaktupaya. What is the way of Shakti? Having now expressed that everything you can do with your body, breath, and mind is the way of the individual, is only the beginning of tantric practice, what then is the subtler, more interior aspect of practice? Last week, what did we discuss? Shambhava Upaya, the way of Shiva. So you could say, if this was a graded approach, Shiva and Shakti, are you can do them together. Uh, first me, the Anava Upaya, I, I probably need that first. And then I'll be able to do Shakti Upaya. If I can do Shakti Upaya, the way of Shakti, then I'll be able to do Shambhava Upaya. Shambhava means like blessing, Shambhu. So Shambhava Upaya is the way of blessing, the blessed means. It's like, like you shouldn't really think of it as the way of Shiva or some people don't even call the way, this the way of Shakti. They just call it the powerful means. Shaktupaya doesn't necessarily have to mean Shakti. It just means really powerful, really powerful technique. And I think when you hear what they are, you, it, it's going to be kind of, kind of impressive and surprising. Sorry, let me just set that up. Okay. So what is the way of Shakti? Before we can understand the way of Shakti, a brief review of the way of blessings, Shambhava Upaya. So last week we talked about this in every single event of your life, there is awareness there. That's a fact. Awareness attends to each and every one of your experiences, since without awareness, there wouldn't be that experience in the first place. So let's say I'm feeling sad, meaning there is a sad state of the mind present in this moment. I am aware of that. In other words, that is happening inside awareness. And let's say the mind is in a happy state. So the mind is colored by a feeling of joy or happiness. That too happens in awareness. So whether the mind is in a sad state or in a happy state, in both cases, awareness is there. More importantly, awareness is there in both cases in equal measure. It's not like I'm less aware of sadness and more aware of happiness. I'm equally aware of both. If I drink a cup of coffee, the mind becomes alert and fresh. So the mind becomes more attentive, but awareness is unchanged. This is important. A lot of people think when I drink a cup of coffee, I become more aware. Not so. I become more alert and I am aware of that alertness. And if I, I don't know, try to teach a yoga class at 6 a.m. in the morning, which I did this morning, I'm not that alert. I'm like, 
<laughs> and so I can feel the mind is dull, but the awareness that I am is equally aware of that. Okay. This means in every single cognition, awareness is ever present, whatever that cognition might be. That's why in this tradition, we say God is awareness. Who is awareness? The awareness that you are. There's no need now to qualify that statement. We do so in lecture time. So to get to the practice, the practice of Shambhava Upaya then is not really a practice. As we stressed last week, it's, it's not something you can suddenly decide to do. Although, yes, it's the way of the itcha, the way of will, but it's very hard to like just will your way into Shambhava Upaya because this is what it constitutes. If you are to practice Shambhava Upaya, what it means is that in each and every cognition, sadness, happiness, dullness, alertness, pain, pleasure, sunlight, moonlight, in whatever cognition, you are more aware of awareness than what it is awareness is aware of. That's what Shambhava Upaya is. So you're more interested in your subjective experience of the moment than in the objective experience of what's actually going on. This is what turns you into a Brahmagyani because essentially now you will have Samadrishti, right? In the Gita, it says, who is an enlightened person? Only that person who has Samadrishti, which, which sounds a bit like an ocular defect, right? Same sightedness. <laughs> but no, it's the ability to regard everything as blessed and good. Why? Because whatever the content is, God is there too, as that. So this allows you to experience, in Tantra, it's called Samarasa, meaning same taste. Everything tastes blissful. Why? Because everything is just awareness becoming aware of awareness. So notice, this is not really a practice insofar as you can do it. It's actually a state. It's, an, in my opinion, an attainment to be able to move through your life and in each and every encounter be plunged into your essence, nature as awareness. Oh, that sounds like, you know, enlightenment to me. So how do you practice it? Well, simply... The Vijnana Bhairava Tantra will point your attention to certain things like look at the sky. Now close your eyes and note that awareness is like the sky. So like this, just an everyday cognition of something like the sky can trigger this recognition of your essential nature. But notice it's passive. So like Shiva, who is always lying like a corpse under Shakti's feet, it's not something you do. It's something that happens to you. It occurs. It's a spontaneous awakening into your true essence nature. So you can't do it. Now, the Shaktupaya, the empowered means, is actually the preferred practice of non-dual Shaiva Tantra. So here's where our class begins. What is Shaktupaya? To understand this, you must understand what Shakti is. The Devi, Shakti, is not different from Shiva. This is very important. Shiva and Shakti are this, like, to compare them is to compare fire and its heat or a snake and its wriggling motion. You would never say that a snake wriggling is a different snake than a snake still. Nor could you say heat is some other thing that stands apart and independently of the fire. Where there is fire, there is the power to burn. Heat is the potency of fire. Where there is a snake, and a living snake, there is the ability to bite and wriggle and slither and swim. It's not that swimming, wriggling, and biting are separate from the snake. It's the potency of the snake. So what is Shakti? She is the ability of awareness to become a Madeline, a Thais, a Chandra, a Nish. It's the ability of awareness to diversify itself. In the Tao Te Ching, it's called the mother. Yes, Madeline, the snakiness of the snake. I like that. Let's use that from now on. Shakti is the snakiness of Shiva. Right? I like that. That's why she's often compared to a kind of moving serpent because she's experienced as that in the body, as, as a kind of serpentine motion. Okay. So this is Shakti. She is the movement of Shiva. There is no Shiva without Shakti. So what does Shakti do? She diversifies. The most important function that Shakti does in relation to all of this is she presents to Shiva, through Shiva, a game. The game of this life, the game of, of this world, you know. And she does it by becoming. So you could say Shiva is being and Shakti is becoming. Being is not different from becoming. One is the noun, the other is the verb of that noun, you know. Okay, so now she's becoming, right? What is she becoming? Literally everything. She's becoming bodies. The insect kingdom is proliferating every day. She's full of creativity, pregnant with potential. In the Tao Te Ching, she's the mother of 10,000 things, right? Even the Tao, the Tao Te Ching, people forget that it's two things, the Tao and the De. Ching means book. 
So Tao Te Ching means the book of the Tao and the De. The Tao is that non-dual, no thing that cannot be spoken of. The De is the pouring forth of that into form. It, it, mother of 10,000 things. I think back then, 10,000 things is so inconceivable a number that he might as well have said infinity, right? 10,000 things. Like, oh, that's a lot of things. <laughs> so she is infinitely creative. But now this is key. How does she create? With what does she create this world? Remember, this is non-dual Shaiva Tantra. So there can't be like some building block that exists, like some kind of inert matter that she uses to sculpt into a world. And then suddenly she stands apart from that world and pulls the strings like a puppeteer. No, not like that. That's the scheme you get in dualistic religion where a goddess or a god creates the world and then fucks off. And either lets people like duke it out because of free will or like, you know, that's not how it is here. Here, because Shakti is all that exists, Remember, she's not separate from Shiva. It's just Shiva slash Shakti because that's all that exists. She uses herself as a canvas um, to create the world. But wait, what, what is she? What kind of things? What substance is she? We know it's consciousness. Yes, of course. But we go further. In Tantra, we say consciousness is also um, mantra, mantric potency. It's the word that was with God, that was God. And this word is not a spoken word. It's a vibration. So she is the primordial vibration, meaning she is the mantric body of Shiva. It's a very mystical thing to say. It doesn't really make that much sense outside of experience, but she is Shiva's vibe. So there's a person and there's the person's vibe. She is the vibe of Shiva, the energy of Shiva. And that energy is mantric potential, meaning her body is made of sound. In other words, consciousness is a sound. Not a sound you can hear or speak per se, maybe more a sound that you can feel and maybe not even that. It's far deeper than the level of experiencing. It's, it's something so subtle. Anyway, from this mantric body of, of Shiva, this, this Shakti, comes bij mantras, innumerable bij mantras. And they don't mean anything in Sanskrit. They are what we call phonemes. They're just pure vibrations. Many of them don't even turn into sounds. Sounds like vocalized and audible sounds are the grossest and densest expression of this body of Shakti. She, generally speaking, has four levels. One is the Paravak, the supreme level, which is pure mantric primeval sound. Um, then the next one is Pashantivak, which is like a subtle form, but still in some you know, form. And then there is Madhyamavak, and this is important. That's thought. Madhyama, meaning middle, represents her vibrating as thought. And finally, you get Vaikarivak, which is spoken word, meaning language. So this universe is created, lo and behold, from language. That's the claim here. Everything you see around you is there because your language structures have put it there. This, in one sense, you can understand this as linguistic determinism. If I don't have a word for something, I won't see it. But it's not really that, you know, because linguistic determinism is a little solipsistic. It suggests that if you don't have the word, it therefore isn't there. We're not saying that. We're saying that beyond even spoken language, there is a mystical language of bij mantras, phonemes, sounds, etc. And that forms this world as if each sound was a building block. If you could look at the code of this reality, you wouldn't see zeros and ones. You would see these mantras. Everywhere around you is mantras vibrating in the air, vibrating in the table, vibrating in your body. All of this world is but mantric body of Shiva. And so working with mantras is very powerful. But chanting a mantra that your guru gave you is still anavopaya. And so if a guru gives you a mantra, Om Kring Kalikaye Devye Namaha. Oh, you've been initiated. You got Diksha. You have a mantra. Now you go take your Japa Mala and you do that. That's the main practice actually of our tradition. But that's still anavopaya. What then is Shaktupaya? Now given that Shakti is a language structure. She's the languaging of the universe. She then creates in the mind two types of thoughts. One thought is called a pure thought form and the other is called an impure thought form. A pure thought form emanates from the deepest level of reality, from the Paravak, from the supreme body of Kali. So Kali, by the way, in Sanskrit, Kal, that root in Sanskrit, is the root of many words in Sanskrit that mean to conceive or to think of. Think like Kalpana, Sankalpa. Any word in Sanskrit often that has to do with conception has as its root Kali. Isn't that beautiful? So Kali is anything you can conceive of, meaning 
Kali is actually the mind. It's really trippy to think this because we often think, oh, Shakti, Kali, that's the body, right? Here we're saying, no, there is no, the body is the mind and mind is the body. Mind is a sensual experience and body is a mental experience. All of it is just vibration. There's no distinction between mind and body. You know, it's all just, there's no distinction between thought and emotion. It's all just vibration, sound. It's all just music, you know? So given that she's music, she's pure music, here's how we work on her level. She's so subtle, right? So she's subtler than even movements of the hands. Even reciting a mantra, that's still too gross for Shakti. I mean, she's so subtle that you work with her by working with her purified thought forms. So now think a thought. That thought is Shakti. It's a vibration. Each thought vibrates in your awareness in a certain way. Some of those thoughts vibrate in such a way that they hide your real nature from you. So these are called Ashuddha Vikalpas, impure thought constructs or misaligned thought constructs. They too are Kali, by the way, but they're, they're called, uh, what do you call it? Um, Avidya Maya. They're Kali in her trickster aspect. So that's the goddess playing her game of hide and seek in her hiding function. Then the opposite of an Ashuddha Vikalpa is Shuddha Vikalpa, as we discussed last night. This is a thought construct that is connected to the deepest level of reality such that by thinking it, by contemplating it, by holding its energy in your mind, you can tap into the primeval vibration that is Kali. So sometimes when you think a thought, notice it actually does increase your energy. No, certain thoughts excite you. Other thoughts depress you. Notice all your energy is tied to your thoughts. Why does your body look the way it does? Because of your thoughts. You know, if you have a certain thought structure, your body will just make that shape because of the thought. It's like the body and the atoms that make it up are so many ball bearings that gather around the astral blueprint written up by the vibration you're holding in the mind. You know, so this is the trippiest thing and probably the deepest thing that I could possibly convey because it's at the heart of this tradition. What is Shakti? She is not the Blue Yeti microphone. She is not the book because the book is actually pure mantra. When you look at a book in front of you, what you're seeing is a mantra, the mantric body of Shiva vibrating. To work with the book's mantra is to work with the subtle thought form that caused the language structure, that caused the form book, that caused your experience of the self-same book. You see, we're peeling back layers of reality from the gross to the subtle. Now, if you can feel this, here's what will happen. You will feel like this body and this mind that you take yourself to be is but a note in a symphony of Kali and everything around you is sound. And you will kind of be yourself a sound now, the mantras, Om Shri Lakshmi Devi Namaha, are no longer a name. They are literally the sonic body of that deity to which they correspond. So what is Lakshmi? Literally that word. When you say Lakshmi, you are literally caressing the goddess with your tongue every time you say that word. Lakshmi. She is that sound. Shri. That is the goddess. And that's how it will feel like in the Shaktapaya. So what do you do here? To do Shaktapaya, and we're going to do that today in our meditation, is to hold in the mind the very subtle and refined energy of shuddha vikalpas to contemplate them so shaktupaya then contrary to popular belief is not hatha yoga or mudra or or any of that that's anavopaya this is actually a gnostic technique of contemplating subtle truths where do these truths come from from shakti but when masters are immersed in that shakti they spontaneously express this in poetry in song in children's movies, and in most of all scriptures. That's where we get our Shuddha Vikalpas. So any scripture from this tradition, any of the Agamas, will give you Shuddha Vikalpas. So today, I'll present you one from verse 99 of the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, and we'll talk a little bit as to how to work with the Shuddha Vikalpas. So how do you do Shaktupaya? Remember, unlike Shambhava Upaya, which is something that just spontaneously happens to you, Shaktupaya is something that you do. But you don't need to be sitting a certain way for it. You don't need to have a certain pair of clothes on or be in front of your altar. It's actually something that you should be doing all the time as you move through your day. So in that way, it's a bit like Shambhava Upaya. Okay, so I'm going to give you a Shaktupaya now. I'm going to do it in the Sanskrit. Then we're going to say it in English and then do the Sanskrit again and then in English. And then we're going to simply sit and contemplate it. That's what today's meditation is, is going to be. 
So we'll do that for like maybe 20 minutes. And then more to me, what's exciting is in the last 10 minutes of class, we'll talk about it. You know, we'll ask everyone like, okay, what does it mean to you? Because when you speak, you're expressing thought and that maybe is an anavapaya, but it has a shaktapaya vibe. Okay, one more thing to note. Those of you who were in class last week, you have a, uh, actually another thing that you can do. You can also do Shambhava Upaya. Because didn't we say earlier, anytime you're aware of anything, there is awareness there. And that includes being aware of a, of a Shuddha Vikalpa. So while you are contemplating in a Shaktupaya way, you can also at the same time open yourself up to Shambhava Upaya. The pure energy of holding a thought in your mind can trigger a sudden awakening into awareness. So this is the kind of reversal. The most embodied practice there is in Tantra is connecting to the mantric body of Shiva, which you can experience in thoughts, but in the subtle thoughts, not the bullshit thoughts called the Ashuddha Vikalpas that keep you trapped in a mind world, but in the subtle thoughts that are reunited to pure being. Okay, so here is a Shuddha Vikalpa. Let me find it. It's verse 99 of the Vijnana Bhairava Tantra. So to receive the Shuddha Vikalpa, you know, and by the way, this is a Zen koan. That's where the Zens got it from. They're a tantric tradition. Zen Buddhism is a Northern Mahayana tradition. So they obviously, you know, have many tantric influences. So this Zen koan tradition is probably from Tantra. And notice in Zen, Zendos, like Rinzai school, for instance, the teacher will give you a koan, like in, initiating you into a mantra. It's a bit like that. They give you a contemplation. You sit with the teacher. They give you the contemplation. Then for like the rest of the retreat, you're meditating 16 hour days. The rest of the retreat, you're working on your koan. And at the end, you come back to the teacher and you tell the teacher the meaning of the koan. <laughs> and usually the teacher will say, no, back to your mat. <laughs> and then you'll come back again and again and again until one day you get the koan. And, the teacher, and that day you're enlightened and the teacher smiles, you smile. Probably no words are passed and you just laugh. You know, that's kind of, it's like a Zen koan. So here it is. To receive this koan from Shiva, Vignana Bhairava, verse 99. Let's come and sit up tall. Ah, hello, Casey. Hello, Deb. And maybe we'll close the eyes. In Tantra, we like the eyes open, but maybe we'll close the eyes for now. Relaxing the corners of the lips. Softening the jaw and softening the base of the neck. Listen to all the sounds around you. And note that what you are hearing is only the outer shell of sound. Beneath, beneath the layer of sensate sound is an unplumbed and unfathomable depth of movement, dynamism, energy, vibration, in short, Shakti. So for a moment, just connect to the pulsing and throbbing of this moment as sound, as smell, as taste. And note that this body that we consider ours is part of that pulsing and throbbing. The breath, and the emotional state in this moment is one seamless whole with every other sound, smell, taste around you. You are a mantra. Listen to the mantra that is your very own life. Some mystics say it is the mantra so hum or hum sa. Listen carefully to your breath. You might hear that, not because you are pretending to or artificially reciting it in the mind, but because it's actually there. Inhaling, a sound like ha. Exhaling, a sound like sa, hum sa. Or for some people, they hear sa on the inhale and ha on the exhale. So hum, which of course means I am that, that am I. That I am. What are you? Who cares? 
that you are matters. So as you contemplate your miracle of pure being, the profound sense of your own aliveness, know that Vishwam Sharira Shivaika Eva Shivaika Rupa Eva Kevalam that you are that being whose body is the whole universe. All throbbing and pulsing in one energetic dance of mantric potency. And from that ocean of mantra comes this thought. It is a Shuddha Vikalpa, meaning it is a refined, high energy thought that conveys to you truth, pure nonverbal truth in a verbal sense. So let's do a quick mantra and then the thought. Oh. Tat Purushaya Vidmahe Mahadevaya Dimahi Tanno Rudra Prachodayahat Om Namashivaya Satatam Panchakritya Vidhayane Chidananda Ganaswatma Paramatava Basine Om Namashivaya Here is verse ninety nine Nirnimit Tambavej Gyanam Niradaram Brahmatmakam Tatvata Kasya Chinnaitad Evam Bhavi Shiva Priye All knowledge is without a cause. All knowledge is Niradara without support. All knowledge is error. Brahmatmakam. Branti. Error. In reality, Tatvata, this knowledge does not belong to anybody. Contemplating in this way, O oh dear one, one becomes Shiva. So again, contemplating in this way, O oh dear one, one becomes Shiva. Nirnimittam bhavej jnanam niradaram brahmatmakam tatvata kasya chinnaitad evam bhavi shiva priye All knowledge is without a cause, without a support, and ultimately deceptive. In reality, this knowledge does not belong to anybody. Contemplating in this way, O oh dear one, one becomes Shiva. I will now read to you the Swami Lakshmanju commentary on this verse. And perhaps that might guide our contemplation. Swami Lakshmanju says, This is the next process. This objective cognition, jnanam, has no cause to rise. How does it arise? It is a wonder. This field of objective cognition, jnanam, knowledge, is niradhara, baseless. It has no support. Hence, it is brahmatmakam. You only feel the rise of this cognition. But the objective cognition which rises in you does not really rise at all. This field of objective cognition is rising in you in the daily routine of your life. It rises in you always. But in fact, it does not rise at all because it is nirnimittam. It has no cause to rise. How does it rise? It is supportless. If it is there, it is an illusion, brahmatmakam. The rise of cognition of the objective field is illusion. It is an elusive perception. This perception is not real perception. This is what he says, he being Shiva, in this process. In Vedanta, they call not only objective consciousness illusion, but also subjective consciousness. That means they have ignored that I consciousness. So this is a different school of thought. In fact, there is no objectivity because there is no cause for it to rise. There is no support of this objectivity 
accepting that you have projected this elusive I-ness on this objective consciousness from your birth to innumerable births. You have created this perception of objectivity. Objective perception is not at all established. I thinks I only. I consciousness is to be taken in God consciousness and God consciousness will be diluted and merged in universal I consciousness. There you are at home. In fact, kasya chinna eta, for those who are not realized souls and for those who are realized souls, for both of these, the question of objective consciousness does not arise. Evam bhavi, in this way, when you contemplate and put your awareness like that, you become one with Shiva, one with that universal God consciousness, I consciousness. This is Shaktopaya. This cannot be Shambhavopaya. So I'm not sure if that commentary made anything clearer, but let's go back to the verse and contemplate it. Nirnimittam bhavej jnanam niradaram brahmatmakam tatvatakasya chinnaitat evam bhavi shiva priye all knowledge is nirnimittam without a cause niradaram without a support and brahmatmakam deceptive in reality this knowledge does not belong to anybody evam bhavi bhava contemplating in this way oh dear one one becomes shiva shiva priye Now, the thing about uh, Shaktupaya is that some of them will work for some people and others will work for other people. So I'm going to present, present an alternative now. So an option. If you didn't like that one, you may work with this other one. So I'm going to read to you now verse 102. It is another Shaktupaya. Verse 102 is as follows. Indra Jala Mayam Vishwam Nyastam Vachit if one meditates on the universe as a magic show or as a painting or as a moving picture contemplating again contemplating on everything in this way one experiences sukha bliss sukod gamaha one experiences or one is led to bliss. One experiences bliss. Here is Swami Lakshmanju. This whole universe is a magician's world. This is not the real world. Indra Jala Mayam Vishvam. Vishva means everything. Maya means illusion. Indra Jala is like kind of a Indra's net. It's like a web of glistening jewels. Just imagine that this whole universe is only magic, a magical trick. It has no substance in it, no substance of its own except God consciousness. This Vishva, the universe, is only a magician's trick. Do you know who is the great magician? The Lord himself is the great magician. He has created this trick and placed it before us and we think we are differentiated, although we are undifferentiated. It seems that we are differentiated from each other. But in fact, we are undifferentiated. This is only expansion of oneself. This is not differentiatedness of oneself. Expansion is vikasa, blooming. Just as the bud blooms, that is vikasa. And this whole universe is the vikasa, expansion of your own self, of sva tantriya, which by the way means freedom. This is Shaivism. This is not maya. This is not illusion. This is only expansion of your own nature. If you perceive yourself as differentiated, that is Indrajala. That is only a trick played by Lord Shiva to confuse you. You are confused. You do not know what to do. You think that he is your enemy. He is your friend. She is your daughter. He is your son. 
you are lost in that magician's trick. Or imagine that this whole universe is only a painting of one's own self. Nyastam ba chitra karma va. Nyastam, it means it is a very well-drawn painting. Brahmadva dhyayata sarvam. Or just imagine that this whole universe is not stationary. It is moving. Very Buddhistic point here. It is moving from one point to another. Brahmat means moving. It is on the move. It is not destroyed. He has moved from one point to another point. One moves from childhood to youth, from youth to old age, from old age to death, from death to the next birth. It is movement, so it is only a movie, a great movie. In this way, it is only a picture, a movie. The projectionist is one and the magician is one. When one perceives and contemplates in this way, then the state of real bliss takes place. The ayata pashyatashcha sukod gamaha, the rise of bliss takes place. This is shaktopaya. First is dhyana, then shakshatkara, because there are two states. That is why it is shaktopaya. If it were only dhyana and sukod gamaha, then it would be shambhavopaya. Because it is first dhyana, you just have to contemplate on it, then perceive it, and then that real state of bliss will arise. This is shakt opaya. Dhyana is the functioning of the mind. Dhyana means meditation. But the perceiver is thought. Mind is that individual being who has got differentiated perception. Thought is the desireless state of the mind. Thought is just nearing that atma, the state of atma, self. That is the difference between thought and mind. Thought is nirvikalpa, mind is savikalpa. Thought is paramarsha, shakti paramarsha, not vritti paramarsha. Vritti paramarsha is mind and shakti paramarsha is thought. There are differences between these two states. Vritti paramarsha disappears when your paramarsha is developed in full awareness. Then it takes the form of shakti paramarsha. When that awareness is trodden down, then it takes the formation of vritti paramarsha and you are then roaming in the mind. Otherwise, you are shining in thought. So we'll do a class on that last bit. There's a lot to unpack there. But for now, I'm going to leave you for some meditation for about 15 or so minutes. And it is either on verse 99 or 102. 99, all knowledge is without a cause, without a support and deceptive. In reality, this knowledge does not belong to anybody. Contemplating in this way, one becomes Shiva. Verse 102, if one meditates on the universe as a magic show or as a painting, this is dhyana, meditating, or as a moving picture, then here is the Shaktupaya, contemplating on everything as if it was a magic show, painting, or movie picture, then one experiences bliss.
one thing to note is that this is Shaktupaya, not Anava Upaya. So note that this doesn't have to be a meditation. It's a contemplation. So it can be done with eyes open. It can be done in the middle of a yoga pose or from pacing up and down in your room. And it's encouraged that you sometimes do this with pen and paper, with stick and sand, with chalk and chalkboard, with finger in water on a dry surface, like that. So you're supposed to puzzle this out. What does it mean, this statement? Knowledge is without a cause, without support, ultimately in error. What does it mean that knowledge doesn't belong to anybody? What do you mean this world is a magic show, a moving picture, a painting? Who is the magician? And in what sense is this an illusion? Puzzle it out. Rebut it. Translate it into the other languages you know and see how the statement sounds in a different language. Move the words around a bit. Play with the thought in your mind. So like this, don't be confined to a certain posture or a certain closed-eyed practice. Feel free now in the final few moments of our meditation, nine more minutes, to like do whatever. You can take yoga poses. Maybe that will help you. Go upside down. Maybe you'll have a new sense of it. Look at the sunlight resting against the wall. Look at your own hands. Are they your hands? Do you know your hands are there? Whose knowledge is that? Is it your knowledge that these hands are in front of you? Whose hands? Like that. Feel free to move.
one aid to Shaktupaya is memorizing a verse. So in Vedanta, there are certain sentences, they're called maha vakyas, meaning great statements. They are like aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, or I am Atma Brahma, this very self is Brahman, or tattvam asi, that's what you are, like that. So memorizing them, you might just think about them every now and then, contemplate them like that. So we're closing now. I'll do a mantra, uh, not a mantra, a song, Devi Sotra. And it's perhaps one of my favorite expressions of this Shakti philosophy. So if it feels appropriate, you can bring the hands over the heart. You might bow the face. And this is Abhinava Gupta's Devi Sotra, hymn to the goddess. Om Hrīṁ Hrīṁ Kālikaye Devye Namaha Tavachaka Chanana Stutiram Bike Sakala Shabda Mai Kilate Tanu Nikila Murtishume Bhavadan Nayo Manasi Jasu Bahish Prasara Sucha Iti Vichindiya Shive Shamita Shive Jagati Jatamayat Navashadidam Stuti Japar Chanachin Nakaluka chana kala kalasti me Tava chaka chana nastu tirambike Sakala shabada mai kila tetanu Nikila murti shume babadanayo Manasi jasu bahish prasarasucha Iti vichinti shive shamita shive Jagati jata mayat navashad idam Stuti japar chana chintana varjita Naka luka chana kalasti me. O mother, there is nothing whatsoever in the form of a spoken word that is not a hymn praising you. How can I praise you, mother? For you have become the very words that I use to praise you. For are you not the primeval sound, the primordial vibration? All words and sounds are made up of the letters that pervade your body. For you are Malini, the goddess garlanded in letters, and so the futility of my worship, mother. Whether I know it or not, I am in truth always worshipping you. All my actions, inside and outside of the temple, are so many mudras in an unceasing puja to you. All of my words, my prayers, my hymns, and my conversations with worldly people, all of them are so many hymns praising you. And so, Mother, whether I've been aware of it or not, I've done nothing but worship you my whole life. Mother, I can do nothing but worship you, whether I know it or not. And so, Mother, I thus declare that there is no form in the universe, nor is there any thought in the mind that does not afford me the opportunity to perceive you and embrace you. As the consort of the Supreme Bhairava, you are ever intent on removing my every affliction. Salutations to you, Mother Ambika. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu.